and welcome to another week of A Weasel, a Pickle, and Levi. You're joining us live in studio from Geneva, Switzerland. We are in John Calvin's home. Uh, we're enjoying some wonderful theological talks. We're drinking some nice ale. Parks is not drinking anything, of course. He is a teetotaler. Uh, this is a very special week of the podcast because we are joined by uh, a, a minister of the word, El Domine, Drew Hukema. He's a pastor in the Christian Reformed Church. He's pastor of my church, actually, back home. Uh, we're glad to have him on the podcast. Thanks, Drew, Chase. I, I appreciate it. It is, uh, to, to put it lightly, a privilege and an honor. I, uh, I I speak to over a hundred people on a weekly basis, and uh, the nerves of this particular moment far far exceed what I deal with on a weekly basis. <laughs> yeah. So it really is to, for you to be able to to be able to contribute to this esteemed forum and to visit Switzerland. I had never been uh, before, so it's everything I thought it could be, and then some. Oh, you, yes. You're rightly nervous because we have a massive audience and we make a lot of money. <laughs> this will get you famous. And be careful with what you say. Our our listeners are very, uh, they're feisty. Well, you, you mentioned that it's going to make me famous and that is the singular end of pastoral ministry. So this is just <laughs> one step on the ladder. <laughs> Whatever you guys can do for me, I appreciate. <laughs> yes, you truly will be the next John Piper. I, so sar so their sarcasm is is that something that work in this space is sarcasm is is that a is a sarcasm welcome here or am I gonna have to am I gonna have I to maybe tone all, down the sarcasm that's the only language I know how to speak <laughs> okay I thought the I mean, correct that's answer would be like no absolutely no sarcasm and just move on thank you Nathan that's good because <laughs> that was sarcasm. Yeah, very. That's wonderful <laughs> irony there. I think I'm. Funny. We can move on. Really, what makes me the most what makes me the most nervous is um, I I think that I know what I'm going to get from Chase in that he's going to he's going to try to throw some curveballs and and he's going to hang him and if if he hangs him I'm going to hit it out of the park. I know what he can throw. I, I think Nathan's going to come with some just straight heat and, and he can throw some heat, but I can turn on a fastball. Whereas uh, Parks is more of like your knuckleballer. He's a junk ball thrower. And I just don't know. <laughs> oh, I don't yeah. know what's going to come from that, from that corner. And that's what really makes me a little nervous here to be, to be honest. Yeah. I'm prepared. So <laughs> What kind of ale are you drinking there, Parks? I am actually a teetotaler. So this is a um, bubbly water. Oh, get that out of here. I've, I've We're actually kicking gotten you off to... the podcast. <laughs> the I, hey, hey, I, I have uh, grown a taste for these. These are okay. Like, I, okay. No, not, not anything close to like a soft drink. But I don't drink um, pop as much as I used to which was like once a week and now it's once a like year that so was this every is a, thursday night yes yeah yes. yes you were getting pretty fat so that's a good idea <laughs> <laughs> uh drew we we every week we uh do um a shower thought from reddit it's a subreddit called shower thoughts and then we we start out the podcast with that and discuss it. You're you're using terminology that I mean you have to you have to understand that I might be my my birth certificate might tell you that I'm 31 years old, but you're talking to a 65 year old right now. So <laughs> subreddit. I uh, I don't know these things. I don't. It's an internet platform such as Facebook, which you're probably on if you're 65. Ah, the, fa the Facebook. Yeah. Sure. Okay. <laughs> really, all you need to do is listen to this next phrase that I say, and we're going to talk about it. That's what okay. matters. Okay. Okay. That sounds like fun. Okay. 
here we go. Listen up. If we all knew for a fact we'd get reincarnated, we'd probably be more concerned about the future habitability of the earth. Did this come what do we do now? Now we talk about it. Do you have any <laughs> thoughts? I get to go first. I came from India. Nathan can go. Nathan really oh, has I don't... a lot of good things to say. Yeah, I want to hear what Nathan has to say on that. Like, I'll just say it for a third time. I just think this is from India. That's it. You think, well, what, what's the giveaway? Because it's Hinduism. And everyone from India is Hindu. That's quite the blanket statement. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, Buddhists believe in reincarnation too, right? I have no idea. I have no idea. But that's to me what do where Buddhists my mind believe? goes. Uh, on that particular question, I don't know. I don't know where Buddhist stands with reincarnation. My my knowledge of world religions is fairly limited. But um, I uh, the goal of Buddhism is is to be snuffed out, is detachment. Yes. So I, I don't think there's much of a reincarnation in the way that Hinduism. But um, I uh, I think that. A lot of people live as if they're not going to die anyways. So I don't know if it would change your opinion or the way that you go about your life if you knew you were going to be reincarnated. And maybe it would depend on what, if you knew what you were going to be reincarnated as. So if you were going to be reincarnated as a, as a cat, wouldn't you be an, an ardent supporter of feline rights? That's true. And privileges? Which I am anyways, yeah. I really do support that a lot. I think I would just be really sad if I knew I was going to be reincarnated as a cat. Like, what did I do wrong? <laughs> you think that that would be punishment? Absolutely. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that at all. I think I as much as I, I dislike cats, uh, it wouldn't be so bad to be one in the sense that there's very little expected of you. Um you aren't required to do tricks it's it's just kind of sit on the couch and that's true but as a cat then you're not loved i feel like because nobody likes cats okay that's I true love i agree cats. with that cats i think to our viewers out here who love cats i'm with you i love a cat <laughs> I'm gonna put it out here if you love cats you need to stop listening right now and get off okay it, does Ian Nelson <laughs> listen to this podcast? Yeah, he does. Okay, well, he posted just a disgusting picture the other day of him holding a kitten. It was the grossest thing I've ever seen. Well, no, whoa. <laughs> so I'm not a cat person, but the problem with cats is that they, what makes cats even worse is that they were at one time kittens. And kittens are phenomenal. Kittens are excellent. They're They're cute and they're... They're, they, you know, they're just, they're really cute. And, and the problem about it is that they become a cat. <laughs> so I, whoever this, whoever this person is that's posted with a kitten is probably going to get a lot of thumbs ups. Is that what they still give on this, on those social media? Uh, not, organizations? not on Snapchat. The There's none of that. Ups? Nope. None of that. Oh. How do you signal that you, that you approve of that then? You send him a message. Yeah, and say, I approve of this, Ian. Yep. Hmm. Do you have, Chase, do you have any thoughts about that, that statement? Uh, I think um, we're horrible at viewing the future anyways, and so we, like, people just don't care about anything. It doesn't, it's not going to change how you live. So there is a philosophy that, that last night I was, I was uh, talking about the Epicureans, mm. which Chase, you should know a little about the Epicureans, given yeah. your experience preaching from Acts 17. Yes. And the Epicureans have that, the, the relatively common philosophy of eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. So in that sense, this phrase would probably change your approach. 
Do you think Christians are bad at caring about the future habitability of the earth because they know it's going to be the new heavens and new earth are going to come someday? Do you think that brings about complacency in caring for the earth? Yeah, I think subconsciously there's, there's a bit of that. It's all going to burn anyways. So yeah, I'm willing to be, I'm willing, you got, you guys can push back on that though. You're, you're, you have every right to push back on that statement. I mean, I don't recycle or really do anything to help the earth, so I can't really push back on it. Like everything, though, it becomes political. So if you're of a if you're of a certain political bent, then then you will have a, a particular view of the earth and any environmental pursuit, unfortunately, uh, because everything becomes left or right. So there's that aspect as well. Please don't bring up politics on this program. We really, oh, we really right. try to walk a fine line here. We don't want to offend anybody. Have you, do you have any political episodes? No, because we know or... nothing about politics. Well, that shouldn't stop. That doesn't stop anybody from, from talking in our current <laughs> climate. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, that was called a dab. You roasted them, Drew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, knowledge of a particular topic is no longer really a prerequisite. So you is that, might as well ask me questions about, you know, home improvement or something. I'd love to just give See, you that just me. undermined our whole podcast because all we do is we talk about things we know nothing about. We talked about infralapsarianism and supralapsarianism the other week, and we talked about it based off of about 20 minutes of reading like some internet articles. Okay, well, there's some value in that. I'm, yes. um, I mean, you guys were giving your, um, just your, your hot take, your, your impulse. Mm. Yeah. That's what this podcast is. Gut, Actually, gut check impulses. I was going to ask you pastor drew do you think there's any good in talking about something you don't know a lot about like that initial hot take discussion no (laughs) (laughs) i i I guess i could i could say some more but I, i that pretty much sums up my opinion okay so you would say being informed about something and then talking about it is much better than just saying things you have no clue about it might be controversial for me to say that but (laughs) that is indeed my my opinion is that a well-informed opinion that you have well so there there you go though so if you if you're going to want to go from the other side uh um you know devil's advocate could argue that 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 there are no real you know nobody knows of something exhaustively true on one Mm -hmm. hand uh number two i've heard people talk about how um you know so you know sports writer has no right to talk about football if he's never played the game but i disagree with that you can know about a topic having never actually you know played that sport like a pastor could give a fine sermon on marriage even if he was a single man yes yeah yep i know from experience um as someone who did that maybe foolishly but i i received some some good positive feedback after that um yeah i I, that 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 uh I, i had a third point but I don't, you know, I don't have my sermon notes in front of me where usually yeah, my third time it lies. <laughs> I think we've discussed this thoroughly. Uh, let's move on to our next segment. And then next, every week we discuss a quote from wherever. Uh, this week's quote is from Jerry Seinfeld. Nathan, do you know who Jerry Seinfeld is? Nope. Of course you don't. Okay. He's a comedian and a funny actor. He had a show called Seinfeld in the 90s that's quite famous. Drew, you know 
right? Seinfeld. I know very well. I'm I'm wondering why you're directing this at Nathan. Is he uh, Luddite? Uh, like, are you you're not familiar I don't with culture? Any? Yeah, I don't know anything about culture. We quoted Billy Joel the other week, and he was like, "Who's that?" He's saying we didn't start the fire. I know now. You're probably better off for it. Is that right? Honest. Yeah. Oh yeah, like current celebrities, of course, but like a lot of he's, people, I maybe should know the names of. I don't. I mean, you're, Jerry Seinfeld though would be would be for those of us who were around in the '90s, and I don't think any of you were around in the '90s. I was around in the '90s. Were you? <laughs> half a year. Yes. Yeah. For half a year. That's true. There you go. Oh, Nathan, your birthday's in three days, right? Yeah, that's true. Turn twenty-one. Yep. Happy birthday. Big two one. Parks, can what you sing? It? Please do not sing, Parks. <laughs> we should all try to sing together yeah. in unison. Is is Jerry Seinfeld's quote just "Hello Newman"? No, no, that doesn't really <laughs> give us anything to go off of, considering Nathan hasn't ever seen the show, and Parks has seen a couple of episodes. Meanwhile, Chase's life and his philosophies and his and his uh, everything, his, the structure of his entire knowledge is built upon TVs and movie. <laughs> Basically, I am who I am because of the cultural media that I've consumed. Right. Yeah. Which so what's the really big, what's the quote? Yeah, here we go. I've come to the conclusion that there are certain friends in your life that they're just always your friends and you have to accept it. You see them, you don't really want to see them. You don't call them, they call you. You don't call back, they call again. (laughs) (laughs) Do you guys feel like this was directed at anybody in particular? I don't know. I hope. I think this is describing you, Chase. (laughs) I'm that friend to other people. Yeah, well, not the one that calls people. The other one. The one that doesn't call. Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of wants to be. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But also, I understand the other side of it too, and I'm not. I don't want to discuss it due to this being a public, you know. um, Yeah, we. You probably shouldn't name drop people in this setting. You're right. (laughs) Okay, so that was an interesting way as, as you know, we've, we've kind of gone, walked through the path of discipleship together. And I just want to say right now that that was kind of an interesting way to approach any sort of riffs you might have with your friends to just throw a quote <laughs> out like that on a public forum. I think it was... Uh, I use the word interesting. I think, I think it was a, a kind, subtle way to uh, bring up an issue. It wasn't passive aggressive at all. Yeah, it was pretty subtle. Very subtle. <laughs> I thought it was funny. <laughs> yeah, that's, I feel like I've heard this. Did you? I feel like I heard this quote before. We might have watched an episode where he said this quote part. <laughs> yeah. Well, as uh, as a big Seinfeld fan, I uh, I my wife and I continue to watch episodes. Just you know, it's nice when you don't have to. It, it just it when you don't want to think and you just want to have a half an hour of just uh, enjoying a simpler world because the nineties look so simple compared to today. And I, and, and as we've watched it, I've often been struck by the world that they live in no longer exists. And part of what you're saying right now, I think is a part of that world where um, he just has friends that are just like popping by and you're you you get to know like the different people on your on your floor of your apartment building now obviously i live in like the furthest thing from new york city that you could imagine so i don't know what the current status of things is in new york city but i lived in an apartment in the twin cities for a time and you don't ever talk to the people around you and you just kind of see them in the hallway and maybe you nod and you smell whatever they're cooking for supper but um it but seinfeld's world was one where yeah you had people who just kind of kept coming back and they just like became a part of his life 
and that's what makes the show funny. But I don't know if that now you're able to pick and choose the people in your life a lot more than I think you used to be able to. Why do you, you think, agree? What, yeah, yeah, I mean, I agree with that. You're you. Do you think that's a function of people? What is that a function of? So, like, is technology and social media like? Is that the reason? Um, I, I don't know. What do you guys think? I I would say you know for for me making that statement, I, I think. Part of it is the, um, yeah, you don't have to talk to your neighbors too much anymore because you can quick pop a text to your friend that lives across town and set up a time to get together and, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the drop-in has become not socially acceptable anymore. Like, if you just show up at somebody's house, it's like, why didn't you text me first? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Or if you, like, drive your moped around mm -hmm. someone's house seven times, wanting to go inside that's not acceptable anymore either and i don't really get that it was that ever acceptable to like circle someone's house i don't know why it wouldn't be the answer to that nathan is is it was never acceptable <laughs> however that doesn't stop certain people from still <laughs> doing it is there a story that should be told there, there? Yeah, so uh, yeah, if some if I'm coming on this podcast and the question is, what's your favorite Chase Pfeiffer story? That would be up there. That would be one of the top ones where I'm just having a quiet night with my wife and we're maybe even watching Seinfeld, I don't know. And and all of a sudden you hear the distinct sound of Chase's moped motor. And then and with like the light shining right in the front windows of your house. <laughs> And just sitting there, and then and then you hear him go around, and then you and then and then pretty soon he's doing laps, and then he stops, and then he shines <laughs> in the window again. And I I'd, I'd lived in this town at this point for like I don't think even a year, probably maybe a little over a year, but it was, it was like no, it was probably it was this. So you came for a summer, and then you left for like six months, and then you came back, yeah. and then so but, it was that next summer. But it was a very so this is South Dakota then. <laughs> it was one of those kind of things. But it turns out that's not really South Dakota. That's just Chase. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's for sure. I was just subtly trying to say I wanted to hang out with you guys without nope. directly saying it. And if I remember right, one of my favorite parts of the story is that you, we, we never came out. <laughs> There you, was, didn't, you, you didn't get in the house. Well, no, this happened multiple times because I think one time you guys like came out and chased me and then the, <laughs> probably the next time you just ignored me. I remember the one where we ignored you a lot more and, and eventually <laughs> I just went away. Yeah. Chase, how old were you? Oh, uh, going into my junior year of high school. <laughs> okay. Okay. As you can tell, I had a lot of friends in high school. <laughs> the difference between Chase and the fly is that is that Chase leaves. <laughs> okay. But um, yeah, that 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 was uh, that, well. This this also can can go to something uh, that the quote that you mentioned can go to uh, depending on what setting you're in. So. So Chase and I talked often about what it's like to go to a school where you have, how many classmates did you have, Chase? Uh, I had five classmates. Yeah, you don't choose your classmates. And when you have five classmates, you're gonna hang out with people that you're like, ah, if we had a class of even 25 or 30, I would probably not really talk to this person. If we had a class of like 100 or 200, I would maybe not even know that person exists, but when you only have five, then yeah. you're you're gonna mm. you're gonna be friends with them. Yeah. Do you think more people going back to like the neighbor kind of idea or like living with people, do a lot of people now choose to live with their friends or like choose who they live next to? Or I guess other people care more about like where they live rather than the people they live next to. I think both happen. I don't know. I do adore. Well, yeah, the people you live next to in college is 
different than you're choosing where you live in a town. I don't think, yeah. I don't think I'm people just really saying care. I'm excited. <laughs> oh, you're saying ex- you're excited. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for, yeah, it's going to be fun. Yes. I don't think, honestly, I don't think I would care where I live. Like, if I'm choosing where I live, like, I'm not going to choose based on who my neighbors are, unless I'm, like, in the hood. Like, I just don't want to live in the hood. May, did it, was that too racial, racially charged? Should I not have said that? It's a little soon to say something like that. Probably. Okay. I better cut that out. Yeah, I'll do some editing and post. <laughs> I don't think many people consider when when I hear people talking about where they want to live, they're thinking through like what is the, you know, is there an Aldi close by? Yeah. Is there, what are my restaurant options? Is there any reformed churches in this town? If you're down. See, it's not even that either. (laughs) No, not, not, not very often. We, I was actually taken aback. Uh, We had some visitors in our church. um, Somebody that lives, uh, somebody who grew up in our church. Now they live in Sioux Falls. They were back in town for the weekend. So they were at our church with, with his girlfriend. And we're asking his girlfriend what brought her to Sioux Falls. And she was talking about how when she was looking for where she was going to live, the main thing that she was looking for was churches in the area. And I remember hearing that and being like, oh, that's odd. Like, that's probably the right way to go about it. But I don't know too many people that are thinking through it from that angle no i think the assumption is you choose where you want to live just based off of what your desires are and then hopefully there's a church around yeah is it a cool place you know a pretty big factor in there is if you and or your significant other has a job there that's pretty important Mm -hmm. well yeah Yeah. especially if like beforehand yeah Mm -hmm. But as remote work comes more into more into reality, then it's it, that won't even be a determining factor. Maybe it will become more. Do we know people who live there? As the location of the job becomes more remote, that could happen. Mm-hmm. Oh well, I think we. have discuss that good enough too did, did you want did you have any more comments about uh where you would like to live chase and any any sort of um politically incorrect <laughs> statements you wanted to make about it or? <laughs> i just i just want to live and i want everyone to be happy i want justice and yeah. peace i want those things gotcha i want sin to die if sin is a thing I, well, i'm not sure Oof. I'm just okay. like okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was such a long <laughs> Radio prof- Drew, we are radio professionals. This is gonna be our fourteenth episode, so we really have got this under our belts. I can tell. <laughs> yeah. I can tell. I appreciate that. I, I and I don't join just any old amateur radio radio hour. I'm right. Yes. I've I have standards. So did you, that's why I'm here. When you were at Northwestern, did you do anything with Life 96.5? No, that was the great beyond. So if you go into the Northwestern Radio Media Center, there's three floors. There's the basement, there's the main floor, which is right where you come in, and then there's the upstairs. So you go into the main entryway and you can see the upstairs where all the professionals work, but it's in order to get up there it's it's protected by a card reader and and you always just look up there like wow those people actually are making money (laughs) (laughs) you could get an internship there but i never did get an internship there okay the same building though you never did radio stuff you just did you did a little bit of tv broadcasting right oh i have i have to admit that i i have i have a decent amount of radio experience because i had my very own radio show but it was on the student radio station 97.7 97.7 WVOE, the wow. voice of the Eagles. And it broadcasts about uh, 200 feet, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Good. 
So the motto of the radio station was broadcasting all the way around the world because we streamed it on the internet and halfway across campus. <laughs> wow, that is incredible. Catchy. I love it. Yes. It's really good. So yeah, I had I had a radio program that I uh, there's no as far as I know there's no evidence of it ever existing at, and that's we can be thankful for that. That's really disappointing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my wife says the same thing. Yes. There's a reason why I'm a I'm a pastor now and not a radio host. <laughs> Now maybe this little foray back into broadcasting will, maybe that maybe maybe I'll I'll you know that'll change my mind. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I'll leave it in, I'll leave it in you guys' hands. The broadcasting world seems pretty safe to me right now. You guys are making it happen. <laughs> no, we we do our best. We're trying to just bring in boatloads of cash. That's what we're our goal is on this program is money. Yeah, I always told you, Chase. Whatever you do, just make sure you make a lot of money. Oh, yeah. I've really tried to live by those words. That's why I'm cleaning toilets this summer and washing windows on an airplane. So I can make a lot of money. Right. Okay, uh, next topic we're going to cover is the Holy Spirit and the Christian life. Drew, you uh, are a pastor. I mean, I guess you could call yourself that. <laughs> Some people do. Uh, some people might. And the lines are really getting blurred these days on what we call a pastor and what we don't. Yeah. But maybe, do you have any wisdom on this topic, uh, on the Holy Spirit and the Christian life? Have you thought about it ever? Well, uh, the short answer to your question is yes. Okay. Do you want me to elaborate more? <laughs> not really i think it's that like, okay. it. <laughs> just to be to to be honest chase you it, if i asked you do you have any thoughts about the role of airplanes in engineering yeah i have we're some at, thoughts we're getting at we're getting at a pretty big this is a pretty big topic this is it, it, do you have a do you have a... What is the Holy Spirit's main job? You're looking for a more pointed question, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, at what angle do you want to go to? The Holy Spirit is... Um, I sometimes wonder if, if the Lord decided just for a day to take the Holy Spirit back, what, what would that feel like for Christians? What would that be like for Christians? And I, and I say that because I think we can take for granted the influence of the spirit in our lives so much so that we look for um we look for the the remarkable works of the spirit that that's what gets a lot of the buzz that that's what gets a lot of the attention when it seems like when jesus is talking to his his disciples he puts the focus more on some stuff that we would find relatively ordinary but yet it's not they're not ordinary but yet um I, I just wonder what that would be like if the holy spirit was just taken back for for just a day just to give us a taste and a feel for for what that would be mm -hmm. i mean you look like you look at peter before the holy spirit came when he was just a disciple and the, like i mean all of the disciples they did not they constantly had questions for Jesus and did not understand his mission and just didn't get it. And then you look after the Holy Spirit comes and Peter writes first and second Peter and he has all this knowledge. Like that's got to just be one way in which the Spirit really works is opening our eyes to things and allowing us to see and believe. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, you, when you, the, the Holy Spirit, when you have, but that's a pretty good example when you're looking at the way even throughout acts the way that the apostles handle scripture the way that they bring up these old testament quotations and old testament allusions and are able to see clearly the way that those texts were were talking about Jesus in a way that i think i mean maybe Jesus pointed it out to them while he was teaching them and and spent so much time with them and and after and after the resurrection you have those you, you have the, that period of time 
where he's still on earth and he's teaching them about the kingdom, which would be a great little class to attend. Yes. Okay. So my question was about how the, the Holy Spirit affects our prayer life. Um, and uh, I, I thought of, I looked this up now, but it's Romans 8.26 is what I had previously uh, been talking about, uh, which talks about uh, the Spirit himself interceding for us through wordless groans. But so in that sense, obviously, I think the Holy Spirit affects how we pray. And I'm I, like, I wonder what our prayer life would look like before the spirit came or if it was gone for a day like pastor drew brought up i think it'd be much different when i think of the mediator between our prayers and god i think of jesus yes yes i agree right i like think they both, can be, they both can be praying for us see the role of the holy spirit is just very confusing to me <laughs> i guess this is what that's about but Let's let's go to the old HC, the Heidelberg Catechism. That's where we should look for all of our perfect, answers. Perfect, perfect. I had it pulled up before my computer crashed. What do you believe concerning the Holy Spirit? Question 53 on Lord's Day 20. First, he is together with the Father and the Son, true God, true and eternal God. Second, he is also given to me to make me by true faith, share in Christ and all his benefits, to comfort me, and to remain with me forever. Well, it's not specifically talking, obviously, it's not specifically talking there about prayer. However, um, there there is a there is a comforting aspect to to what the, the you know the, that's that was the first verse that my mind went to what parks mentioned in romans 8 where y- yeah you can you can say both are inter both the, the son and the spirit are interceding for us maybe in different ways because we know that that jesus is at the right hand of god interceding for us um but but i think that that's in a in a slightly different function where that's when it comes to um that's when it comes that that's in a context of um if my mind i could be wrong here but my mind says that's in hebrews where um he's he's working at in a high priestly function and specifically in the context of sin whereas the spirit is in a context of we don't know what we ought to pray for and sometimes like if i've had conversations where somebody says that they they're they're they hurt so bad that they don't they don't know they can't pray they can't feel what to pray or they prayed all so many different things that they kind of run out of things to pray so it seems that the holy spirit is uh is effective in ways that we don't even probably realize maybe might be one of those things that when when you get to glory you look back and you see the ways that the spirit was was connecting you with the father that you didn't fully understand at the time. Mm-hmm. Jesus said it was better for us that he would go to heaven and that we'd receive the spirit. So we know it's important in doing something. Yeah. That had to have been really confusing for the apostles to hear. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's for your good that I'm leaving. Like what? Well, no, that, that wouldn't make any sense at that particular time. And, and I think we probably think like the apostles sometimes where if only Jesus would stroll into the room right now and I could ask him for, you know, do you want us to baptize a baby or not? Um, just a lot of those questions that we have in our minds. Mm-hmm. And as nice as that would be, it's far better that the, the, the divine presence can be anywhere at any time. It's not limited to a particular locality in the same way that Jesus as the incarnate son of God is limited to a particular place. So the way that the spirit can do the roles of Jesus, but everywhere and anywhere um, is, is much better, much more effective, still building his church.
the other the other um the other maybe lesser thought about way in which the holy spirit would be playing a role in prayer is that the is that the holy spirit convicts of sin and that's a, another key role of, of what the holy spirit does where he brings us to that spot where we where we have our eyes open to who we are and and we're able to bring that those things before god and uh and to ask for forgiveness and we believe that a big part of the spirit's role you might have mentioned this i was distracted by something else but like is sanctifying us right that's the job of the spirit within us making us more like christ right yeah if you were going to boil down the 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 different jobs of the persons of the trinity that's the word i would choose for the holy spirit is is the sanctifier because that's that's a big part of when i picture the spirit in my life and in the life of other people like i think of us spreading the gospel and um the spirit enabling us to overcome our own sin because we believe that you know we're totally depraved and we can't you know choose god of our own um accord and it's his role to make salvation and faith possible for anyone because nothing happens without the work of the spirit so I don't, I don't know if that's the a good way to think about it, but that's where my 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 mind always goes. Yeah, absolutely. That um, and that's uh, first I believe First Corinthians at the in the first couple chapters there where he says that the Holy Spirit has shown in our hearts to to help us to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Because apart from that, Christ is foolishness. Um, to those who are perishing. It's gobbledygook. It's nonsense. When Paul goes and he and he is speaking to the people in the Areopagus, and he says he talks about Jesus Christ and he talks about the resurrection of the dead, and their reaction, very spiritual religious people, when they hear that, is, "Who is this babbler? Like this is this doesn't make these these guys are they know religion they've got all kinds of gods and religions and then G, and then Paul comes and talks about Christianity and they're like this is a preacher of foreign divinities this is a this is this guy's we need to commit him or something this is craziness and the Holy Spirit then brings us to see that no actually this is this is it this is the real thing this is this is everything and then and then not and that's the beginning of the Christian life. But then the Spirit's work is not merely to get you in, but then to to take what Jesus says you were. So Jesus says that you're righteous as soon as you become as soon as you come to faith. And then the Holy Spirit makes it so. So that's the job of the Spirit is to make you what Jesus says you are. But he's gonna actually make you that way. So one way that I thought about it, that I've thought about it is um using the illustration of Legos, you could say that the, you could say that the father designed the whole thing, the father and the father is the one who, who makes the whole thing. The, the son purchased the pieces and the son is the one who, who, who is, who has purchased it. And the spirit is the one who takes the pieces and puts them all together. Cause the other job of the Holy spirit is the spirit is building the church right now. So the spirit is the one who is going out and, and like we just talked about opening up people's eyes, but also uh, empowering and and providing courage for you and all of us to, to, uh, to bear witness and to like, like we talk about the, the change that you see in the apostles. One of the changes is that they go from being complete cowards to being courageous. Yeah. And I think that that can only be, I mean, part of it is you, you see, this guy just risen from the dead like that would make you courageous that would make you very certain but there's also a a holy spirit when when again talking talk a lot about the book of acts but you see it especially in the book of acts where um where they're traveling through they're traveling and they're trying to figure out where to go and they want to go to a particular place but it says that the holy spirit would not allow them to go we don't know what that looks like. We don't know if he had a dream. We don't know if uh, or, or if somebody came and said, no, you're not supposed to go, or if they ran into roadblocks. It doesn't say. Luke doesn't tell us 
how the spirit told them not to go there, but he did get the Macedonian call where he did have a guy, the Macedonian saying, come to Macedonia and help us. And in that way, the Holy Spirit is going about moving the pieces and, and directing where the word needs to go. Mm. That Lego analogy is really good. I had not heard that before. I like that. I can even claim that's somewhat original, which is why I, I hesitate to, you know, I'm sure that there's, with any analogy, every analogy is imperfect, if that's one thing right. to, to make very clear. But yeah. that's that's a way that I've thought about it. That's, like, that's, that analogy is very, like, Ephesians chapter one, where it goes through each role of, like, God the Father choosing and the Son saving and the spirit sealing yeah i was <clears throat> listening to a podcast recently the white horse inn with michael horton and um it was talking about sanctification and it was really encouraging um hearing like we think of justification as the sure thing that we become christians and we are surely justified before the father and then we are sanctified which we don't see as it much as certain because it's a continual process. But because we are Christians and we have the Holy Spirit in us, we, are, we will certainly be sanctified just as we are certainly justified. And I find that really encouraging that it's not merely a possibility that we're going to get better, but it's a certainty because the Holy Spirit's living within us. Yeah, absolutely. When... Um... Yeah, in Philippians 2, I believe, when he says that the one who began a good work in you, uh, the Lord isn't a, a Lord of finished pro unfinished products. He's not like uh, me, quite frankly, <laughs> where <laughs> you start something and you're like, this is going to be awesome. And you have this you have this image in mind of this thing you're going to build or whatever. And then and then you get started, which is the fun part. And then and then it's like, wow, this is actually a lot of work. And then it sets there in the corner and you just kind of look at it. And, and, that, that, and that's not the way that the Lord is, even though it's the same way. He starts out and you've got this beautiful design for what he wants to do with you. And then it's a fight. And that's what you're in the midst of in the midst of your, whenever you're in your Christian life. So it feels like, wow, this, this is never going to happen because it's really, really hard. But the Lord isn't one to, to put down his tools and say, yeah, forget it. I just don't think it's going to happen. Um, the blessing and and i believe it i, I think uh the, the blessing from one of the thessalonian letters where he says um may the lord sanctify you through and through the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it it's this guarantee and that's and that's the holy spirit it's that's the only way that it can be possible all right one last question with the holy spirit are you a cessationist or a continuationist? We've talked about this before on the podcast, probably like episode four or five. I'm not sure. What was the, what, was there a verdict among the three of you as far as uh, what the, what, what camp you ought to be in? I think Parks, Parks was like based on what, what passage is that? First Corinthians 14 Parks? I think, oh shoot. I think so. Yeah, based on that, I think Park said he would probably be a continuationalist. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I said, yeah, I could see a very good case to be made, but I don't know enough to make a decision on that topic. And and I think Nathan and I both agreed that we grew up just cessationalist in nature based on where what churches we grew up in. Yep. So, um, yeah, as far as, as far as my own, uh, it, it's, um, so I've, I've thought a lot about the Holy Spirit, but this particular question is one that I would say I'm, I'm still thinking through and, and I'm, if you're like, no, you have to pick one or the other, then I, I'm going to default towards cessationist. Yeah. Um, if I have to pick one, but, but uh, I'll explain a little bit of, of why I think that through uh, in the way that I just said it. Um, so 
uh, as I look at many of the miracles and works uh, that, you know, what the so-called extraordinary works of the Holy Spirit, um, so many of them seem to be, if, if you ask, what's the purpose? Was it just to, to impress and, and to look really cool and to wow? Uh, the purpose is always to validate the gospel and to validate Jesus. Um, all throughout, when, when they're mentioned by the apostles, it's that Jesus was, that Jesus is the son of God. And how do we know? Well, it was attested by various works and miracles. That was the sign that he is who he said he was. And, and through the gospels, it's like my, the way I think about it is it's him um, giving us little glimpses into the age to come. When you see the paralytic jumping up, when you see the lame leap and the blind see, we're getting little looks into the, into the future, what the future is going to look like. Whereas for so many people, you read those and you think, well, obviously the application to, to that healing is we should be able to be healed as well. When it's not, it's just not that simple. Um, and and I, to me, it's not because God can't do those works today. They're his gifts. And so it's up to him to, to give them and to distribute them. So often when you see them or, or when you see them talked about, it's like, what's the, what's the purpose of these, of these gifts and these acts? And I don't know what the purpose is. It seems, it seems to me a little bit when, when Paul is criticizing some of those spiritual gifts in, at the church in Corinth, he's criticizing the fact that they were using these spiritual gifts in ways that were self-promoting. Sometimes that's the way that they feel when they're, when they're in an American context. Um, so to me, the gifts of the, of the spirit, the, the so-called extraordinary gifts of the spirit were for a particular phase to validate the gospel and to establish the church. And then, um, but, and so after that era and after the apostolic age was finished, then their, their necessity is, is, is no longer, it's no longer crucial in the same way. But, uh, so, so here's the, here's the, but here's the hesitation. If you're going to be a firm cessationist, a cons really consistent cessationist and say that, no, the gifts of the spirit have ceased, like they are kaput. That puts you in a weird position when inevitably in life. Um, I mean, I've only been in ministry for four or five years and I've already run into different situations where if you're going to be a firm cessationist, you're either going to call somebody a liar or, um, or you're going to, you're going to ask about particular events and okay, if this isn't a gift of the Holy spirit, if this isn't God, then what is it? Um, and so that's where I still, you know, they're his gifts. They are up to him to give, but, but the purpose is, is typically always, not self-promoting, but to validate Jesus and to establish the gospel. Um, and that's his main point. That's Paul's point to, to Corinth. If you're going to use these gifts, if you're going to have these gifts, it needs to be for the building up of the body and for the encouragement of believers. And so um, uh, that's where it's a, there's a, there's a, I, I, I would, I would lean more, find myself more in the, I'm, I'm convinced by cessationist arguments but that, that puts you in a, in a precarious position when inevitably experience takes you to different people and things that um, I think God can and, and does uh, work in, in ways that are extraordinary still. So maybe that means I'm not a, a cessationist. <laughs> yeah. I, Chase, I think one thing, I think I was leaning more so on the continuationist side last yeah did i did i say that wrong? i think oh, so but that's sorry. okay that's no, right no, no, that's okay that's just fine. but yes. yeah this the first corinthians 14 verse 39 here is what often trips me up in this therefore my brothers and sisters be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongue and so like that seems like a clear command that we should desire that and i like, I guess you can say that that's for that particular time and doesn't apply to us today, but 
Well, what does speaking in tongues mean in this context? It, it's a know. it's a extraordinary gift of the spirit. I, what other way would you take it? Well, a lot of um, what what's the name for that type of church? Churches where people Pentecostal. Mm. Pentecostal, thank you. Where they stand up and they speak in some language that's not an earthly language, they will say, and then another person in their church, like that person won't understand what they said. Mm. This is all, I've never been to a Pentecostal church. So again, like what Drew is saying about experience, I, I don't know because I haven't experienced anything like this, but I've heard like, you know, there'll be someone who has the gift of understanding the tongues. Like, is yeah, that right. The kind of stuff that this verse is talking about. Cause that's something I would have a hard time with agreeing. If you're, if you're speaking in tongues and there's no interpreter and you don't have anybody else there who can understand what you're saying, then you're not, you're not, that's not legitimate speaking in tongues. Yeah. Right. You see, if you're speaking right. only a secret language that only one person can claim to understand and then interpret it as the word of God, that kind of is a little fishy to me, like any new revelation outside of God's word. So yeah, you you got an, you got to another big another big tenet uh, that's in my mind with uh, continuationist or cessationist is is the um, and this gets more to the extraordinary so called extraordinary gift of the spirit where you can hear you know you can hear God speaking and so you say well this this is this is I'm I'm now in the prophetic um, in a way we're all prophets priests and kings that's that's a reformed principle. Um, but like, uh, I was just looking at a video, uh, that's, that's gotten a ton of buzz where guys talking about basically America is going to end by the end of this calendar year. And it's, and it's a prophetic revelation and, and, um, that, that just does huge damage to, to the faith. And if you're going to say, uh, well, that's, you know, I received that uh, uh, as a prophetic revelation, then that guy's word should be receive the same way that we receive John 316 or any other, you know, if this is the word of the Lord, then, um, and some people will distinguish, they'll, 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 they'll make, I don't make this, but some will make a distinction between uh, prophecy and scripture. But if it's, you know, if it's the word of God. Well, most of the Bible is prophecy that's been written down. Like it was just, you know, God speaking the prophets and then they wrote it down later right so at the end of so revelations just, at the end of revelations it talks about you know anyone who adds to these words like all these curses will be prescribed upon them and blah blah i don't know how it goes exactly but mm -hmm. I don't know that's supposed to mean like just this revelation of john is complete or the full revelation of the bible is complete and I've heard it said that the full revelation, because of that verse, the full revelation of the Bible is complete. I think that that's the reference there is, is mainly to John's revelation. Okay. Uh, but we do confess that the Bible is complete. Right. Yeah. The canon, the canon is closed. Yeah. That's, that's the belief. And, and, and yet, you know, if, 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 if there was a clear, uh, the thing about the canon and, and our view of the canon is that we believe that they're God's revelation because they show themselves to be God's revelation. It's not like somebody came along and said, okay, yep, this is, this is, this is the canon. This is, this is God speaking. It was a, it was a consensus saying, no, this is inspired. Like, just look at it, just receive it as being inspired. Um, so, so, uh, and, and just the last thing I'll say on the, on this note is that practically and pastorally, there's a huge amount of damage done when you bring the extraordinary gifts into it and, and people start seeking extraordinary gifts, like listening to the, like God to speak to me. And on one hand, if they don't get God to speak to them, then it's pr profoundly discouraging because you feel like, well, I must not be a true believer. I must not be a true Christian. Or when you do hear some some sort of speaking and you're convinced it's God, I've I know of people who've done some really dumb things because if God said that, you know, I, I have a good friend who who his ex girlfriend he was going to get back together with her. God told him so, and and after she had married, after she had married somebody, he was still convinced of this and pursuing her. That you know maybe he had a bad burrito the night before or something but it was not god talking to him yeah mm -hmm. yeah right 
So well, those are some of my thoughts. Yeah. Well, Drew, time is running out here. Uh, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. What a what a gift. Yes. We think so too. Yes, yeah. thank you very much. Keep it listeners, up, you guys. Listeners, thank you thank for you. Uh, coming through this marathon of a program. And uh, we, we've sprinted, we've jogged, we've trudged through some beautiful topics. And until next time.